Right, okay, thank you for joining The Average Golfer. We're back inside this morning, but we've been out. There's plenty of testing been done because I did a video a week ago, which was, are strong lofted irons a help for average golfers? And it was a great video in the sense that it brought a lot of people's opinions to the table. There's always a split on this debate. And what I want to do is take it one step further. We're gonna put the two types of irons head to head, and we're gonna try and find out are the issues real issues around game improvement strong lofted irons or are they just myth and sound bites there's only one way to find out yeah it is very much a split opinion i think i'm not sure it's a 50 50 split and i think it's fair to say that opinions have and are changing but there's still a lot of throwaway comments that are made that i'm not sure are are backed up anymore. I'm not sure they're based on fact, like I said. I think they're based on, not so much myth, but I think that something that comments that have been made uh, for many, many years now uh, against these type of irons. And I think that things have changed. I think irons have changed. I do believe technology has changed, as you well know, and I do think it has changed. And some of the things that are being suggested are maybe, maybe not correct. Anyway, so what did I do? Well, I went down to Four Golf Chester, as ever. Out on a cold, got in some golf balls, and uh, this was a very simple test. So what we've done, sets of numbers up in front of you now, um, are the two sets of irons, and the irons are irrelevant. So I'm gonna drop the kind of like what make and model they are. We're gonna keep that out of the equation because I don't wanna confuse people. But basically this is, uh, if we look at the lofts of the two, you can see we've got what you would consider a traditional loft and strong loft. And then what I'm going to do is we'll get straight into the first issue, which and the major issue for most, which is the ability, this idea that you need to carry five wedges. It's a comment that is used quite a lot, and I want to see if that is true. So let's throw in the numbers first of all and start at the bottom end of the bag and see what happened. And what you'll see is we've got numbers for pitching wedge and gap wedge. Uh, both um, only one degree difference so this again sort of this comment sort of baffles me a little bit um, but in the game improvement set of irons it was 130 carry and 120 carry with the 50 gap and on the weaker loft did we got a uh, well it's only 46 but in the 50 um, more blade style wedge that we used for the test it was 122 on 113 this argument kind of ends very, very simply because the point is, it doesn't matter which way you work this one back, is there is seven yards difference, eight yards difference on average on the pitching wedge between the two sets of clubs. So for me, we've got well, perhaps one club difference, half a club difference even. So work that back, you go from 50, whatever you want to carry with you, you want to carry a 54, maybe even throw in a 58, whatever you like, but we still end up with three wedges, four wedges, in both sets. It doesn't matter where you finish at 113 or 120, whatever you decide to go back into. I mean, for me personally, I'd be more than happy with a 54 wedge and that's me done. I wouldn't be carrying different wedges. And I think, but, but, but with, with, with whatever you like, whatever, whatever which way you like to build your bag in terms of the wedges, you're gonna end up with three to four wedges in both sets of clubs. So the idea that one differs to the other, I can't see that whatsoever. And the point being, I just want to make one final point on that, is a lot of the comments referred to being able to hit full shots. Well, look, at some point in a game of golf, no matter which bag you're gaming, which loss, you can't hit full shots. There's 40 yards, 50 yards, 60 yards, 70 yards. You've got to find the ability to hit half a shot, three quarter shot with a wedge of your choice. But you will not go around a golf course or a game of golf and not have full shots all the time. That is impossible. So for me, do you need any more wedges with one set or the other? No, it is exactly the same situation. So it leads me on to a bigger problem and that's at the top end of the bag. As you can see, you've got the numbers for the seven irons and then we go up to four iron. And the four iron difference is 190 as opposed to 176. And why is that a problem? And why is it a bigger problem than worrying about gapping wedges at the bottom end of the bag? Well, in my opinion, it's this. My driver distance is probably a 245 to 250 carry. That's on a good day. That's where I'd stick the driver. And then you've got to work back. And I've got to find now a situation by where I can gap between a 194 iron and my driver. 
I think it's quite simple. I think I've got 10 to 15 yard gaps in there where we can throw in some hybrids, a five wood maybe, a three wood, and we'll bridge that gap quite comfortably. Now, let's go traditional lofts. 176 carry with the four iron. You get me that gap in between that and the, um, the 250 carry. I've at least got one more club that I've got to throw in there. But it's difficult to get up to there with, I mean, 176 carry as your longest iron in the bag. We've got, we've, we've got, well, like I said, the minimum we've got is to throw in one more club. But what I would say, the one more club I'm throwing in is a longer shafted club. And what I would ask you is this, what would you rather have in your hands or in your bag? Would you rather have more shorter length shaft clubs or longer? And I know for me on a personal level, if it is a choice between gaming more wedges or gaming more three irons, it's a very simple choice for me to make. I would always rather be carrying the shorter irons. And I spoke to I spoke to David Ledbetter last week in an interview that's coming on the channel. And we talked about where, with limited time that average golfers have on their hands nowadays, where would they best focus their attention? And I think we know the answer. And he confirmed that in his opinion, it was from 100 yards in. That is where... Uh, scores are made for handicapped golfers and where we can reduce our shots going around the golf course. I think it, uh, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate actually of juniors, young players, not actually having all these wedges. Yeah. I think they can, they learn to control the club face, yeah. even with about a 52 degrees yeah. uh, wedge, you know, I mean, we're going back in the day now, yeah, yeah. back to, not, not quite back to Niblix, but uh, the fact is they can start to, you know, they, they've got to, I mean, look, great short game players, exponents, have great hands. They're yeah. able to sort of do certain bit, things. Yeah, you know, look at Phil Mickelson yeah, or, yeah. or Tiger, yeah. whoever. And so um, <clears throat> they're able to do certain things. But if you if you just have a, a club for every for every loft, yeah. but, sorry, sorry, a loft for it. A lot of the club for every swing. every distance. Yeah. Uh, it, it sort of takes a little bit of the feel and the skill yeah, out of what I you want so. to do. So. I mean, look, we don't. Although they might look good to you know average players, a blade iron is a complete waste of time because the sweet spot's about yeah. you know like a pinhead. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, that. when perimeter weighted club came in years ago, I mean, it really was a big help. And that's the area to me where you've got the shortest length club in your hand, where you've got greater control. We all know the longer the shaft length goes the more difficult to control, the more difficult to find the sweet spot. So for me, once again, positives and negatives, I'm looking at, yes, if I've got the choice, I'll give me more wedges. I don't want more longer irons in the bag. I want more wedges. So, but to me, the situation in reality is your problem is exactly the same. Gapping is gapping. There's no difference whether it's more wedges or more. There is nothing that differentiates these two sets of clubs on these numbers. We've got seven, eight yards down the bottom end, gap, or we've got a 14 yard gap when it comes to the top end. Before we start even talking about ball flight characteristics and how that 190 carry is gotten to in terms of launch angle, in terms of descent angle, that's a whole different question. We ain't gonna go there in this video because it gets far too complicated. But that's taking all that out of the equation. We've got a 14 yard gap there at that top end of the bag at four iron and I've got to then start bridging those gaps. And I think that's a far more difficult thing to do for average golfers than it is to concentrate on the shorter end of the bag and having more wedges in. Right, we're going to talk about um, dispersion. Dispersion is something that people commented that there are more issues with dispersion with game improvement irons than that of traditional lofts. And again, um, all I want to say is this. There's no right or wrong answers, by the way, in all this. It's all about opinion-based, and, and, and it's only my opinion, but I'm trying to give it, like I said, some broader background to back up some of the argument. I play seven iron if, uh, at, uh, say, a roughly 160 carry, and if I stand on the tee and someone says to me, I've got 160 carry, then, yeah, I'll reach for the seven iron. And my seven iron will go 160 if everything is, you know, as I want it to be, and I hit a nice shot, put a nice swing on it, all things are correct, and I hit it nice, perfect, 160. If I get a little bit excited, a bit more swing speed, maybe that'll be a 162, 163. If I don't catch it quite right and out the middle, and maybe if I hit a bit of a cut, maybe I'll drop it off to 154, 155. Maybe some wind and other things will impact on it. But the one thing is this, the performance of the club had very little to do with dispersion. It was the performance of the strike from the individual that had the impact on the dispersion. 
And I would say that to blame a club or, or a set of clubs, a game improvement set of irons, have issues with dispersion, again, I find hard to understand because if I then take the stronger lofted set of irons, the player's set, which it will traditionally be, and I put those same three analogies into place, then I think by not finding the sweet spot, uh, which is generally smaller, we can all agree, on the player's type iron, I think that's going to have a far bigger impact on dispersion in a negative way on those irons than on the game improvement. So yet again, the argument that's thrown up as being a potential negative, I see it the complete opposite way around. And I don't really, again, you tell me the other way, which bit am I missing? Because to me, it's been a well-known fact that sweet spot is smaller. If I'm not finding the sweet spot, then dispersion, I'm going to see drop-offs again fairly well known that that takes place with these type of irons and the bigger sweet spot on the game improvement irons might be just a little bit of assistance to avoid a drop off and tighten dispersion not see it getting bigger so for me again it's not an argument that I can really buy into with any great confidence we've then got and it's a very quick follow on from exactly the same situation is gapping issues because of the gaps in loft on game improvement irons. So if you see these up in front of you now again, you'll see eight, nine pitching wedge, gap wedge, five degree differences in terms of the gaps on um, on that of the game improvement, and they're four degrees gaps on the traditional set. Well, all I can say is it, very simple again for me, this one. It's the same analogy, it's the seven iron analogy. Um, whether it be 160, 163 or 154 carry with game improvement type iron, it's very much down to my performance, my own swing. And I'm not, when I when I stand on that tee and I've got 160, um, I'm not accurate enough to worry about one degree of difference. So I can't drop down to, a, uh, uh, go up to a six iron, I can't come down to an eight iron for that one degree's worth of difference because those gaps for me, are tight enough and relevant enough to the swing that I have. There's no, I'm, what I'm basically saying is I'm not that good. I'm not that good to recognize one degree of difference. I think it's that simple. And a, a question again, how many of us golfers out there at the average level are that good to worry about that one degree gap? Because it's not, you know, it, it's 10 degree gap on a, on a perfect day. On a perfect day, you have 10 yard gaps between your clubs. That's on a perfect strike. But that's not reality, is it? That's not what happens when you go out on the golf course. So there'll be some play, some variables in and around that. But if you're good enough to recognise the one degree's worth of difference and it tightens up your grouping, then I think fair play to you. And I think, like I said, this is very much... I review these clubs based on a broad spectrum of players. That's the mentality I try to have. And if you're down that lower end in terms of handicap, low single figures, then maybe that one degree's worth of difference... You know is recognizable uh, then i don't argue with that whatsoever um but i think for the majority what is reality i think if you can notice one degree's worth of difference then uh yeah it, it's i don't think it comes into play for most golfers i'm going to finish off by just talking quickly about um Choice of club by Lewis Johnson, again, who plays golf on the channel quite often. PJ Professionals, a very steady player, Lewis, for any of you who've watched him play golf, very steady. Um, doesn't do a great deal wrong. And out of interest, he's a player, plays tailor-made P790 irons, again, which would be, I think it's half degree difference in the loft on his irons, actually, than what we're looking at today. And he would not ever go back to playing players-type irons. And I think that's a comment again, if you see some of the comments that are coming up for you now, there's a lot of golfers who are clearly low handicap golfers who've seen the benefit of these clubs just as much as um, high handicap golfers have seen. And the point of the video is this, it's a part two, it's a follow on, it's trying to address, I tried to reply to comments, but I, you know, it, I, 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 you can only type so much of an answer without going on too much. So it's trying to address some of those um comments in a way that like i said it's got some fat base and it's not to it's not to prove a right or a wrong because there isn't one like i said it's very much down to the individual what i want to do is try and dispel myths and make sure that if you are going to 
consider buying a set of irons then don't dismiss certain of irons because of this kind of hearsay of certain sound bites of words don't do it for that reason uh, go and try the clubs out and make sure you give yourself the best chance of getting the most enjoyment out of your set of clubs and base that on your experiences your numbers your data and i know to be fair i mean and i know that's what most people would do anyway um but it's it's really that's that's the purpose of the video i think that there's a lot of uh, reviews out there that I, I look at the pro review the pro review is exactly the reason why um you know if they're finding the sweet spot um when they're striking the majority of clubs uh i'm not sure how they can then give an opinion based on what performance an average golfer might get out of a golf club because the reality is it couldn't be further from what you will experience when you go and try them because as you know as golfers at our level we tend to find quite a bit of that club face so the numbers are generally uh, will be quite a bit different and that's the important bit is that you try the clubs you get your opinions you see if your dispersion varies you you try a game improvement against a player's eye and you see whether or not those differences are as uh, sometimes portrayed and I'm not sure that the, when you weigh up the positives and negatives for me there are a lot of clubs that are being dismissed for the wrong reasons and uh, hopefully we've put some limited facts don't get me wrong it's not the most scientific it's very much again all these reviews don't forget whatever you watch on any channel are on a um, a limited amount of data uh, they're very subjective and uh, but they go some way to try and substantiate certain claims or dismiss certain claims that's the idea anyway as ever thank you for watching uh, comments down below hope you enjoyed a follow-on video we don't normally do this normally a video is ended but certainly I thought scope for a part two this is it there's your bit more backup in terms of numbers and again, I welcome the comments down below and let's see if we can keep this conversation going. And my hope is that, like I said, if it's, if, if they're not, it's not to change opinions of individuals, it's just as long as I get golfers questioning certain things, um, then that'll do for me. Uh, and keep the comments nice and civil, keep the communication nice and civil, and uh, we'll carry on with this debate moving forward. Right, thank you for watching and uh, I'm done. I'll see you all soon.